many of you know, I guess I'd say, the artist formerly known as Prince? Raise your hands. Oh, that's more people than I thought. Well, you know, Prince left his name and he has a symbol. Well, I did the same. Look at that C up there. Today, I adopted a symbol. And that symbol is the copy left symbol. So what are we trying to do? Some of us are trying to liberate or make information free. We heard freedom earlier today. I think some of us think that if there's life-saving information, shouldn't we bring it out from behind paywalls where you have to pay for it? And shouldn't it be, instead of a privatized good, shouldn't it be a public good? Something that all of us have access to and all of us can access it freely. And that's what copy left is. So we're going to talk a little bit about medicine, but mostly about uh, information flow. Well, my story begins on the opposite side of the globe here. You can't even see it. It's about as far from Ted as you can get uh, in Stillwell, Oklahoma in 1967. Growing up as an only child in Oklahoma, I was pretty lonely. I didn't have access to much. But my grandmother gave me a nickel, and she sent me down the street, and I bought volume number three of the uh, Children's Encyclopedia, and that's when I went global. I mean, then I could get out of Oklahoma. I mean, I could see what was going on in the rest of the world in 1927. Uh, so it was a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. But the world got really good when the Safeway, the Safeway suddenly said, you know, if you bought, your mom buys enough groceries, you can start to get uh, encyclopedia volumes. And I got the whole set. Then I moved beyond C and D, and I had the whole alphabet. And I was current. It was 1968. But the point is information, books. That was my ticket out of uh, Stillwell, Oklahoma. Fast forward a decade or two. I had a new encyclopedia. It was called Gray's Anatomy. And I, over the years, I learned I study best when I see something and then I write it down or draw it. And I began to write down and draw everything in Gray's Anatomy and on these index cards. I was like a monk. I was a scribe. My sacred text was this Gray's Anatomy. And all those index cards ended up in a shoebox. And, you know, a year or two ago, my son, who's in medical school now, he saw that shoebox and said, oh, my God, that's amazing. I mean, he just sat there and he looked at it all in an iPad. But I wrote it down. Another big day was when I got a computer. And I didn't have to write things down anymore. I could start typing them in. And I was like a pack rat. I never threw away a single note that I took. But those notes became the foundation for all the n things that we used to study for board exams between me and all my friends in the cardiology department. We began to share it all. Not only that, but I began to make slides. And you know, slides really in medicine are the currency of education. You know, you give a talk, you show these slides, that's how we educate each other. In the old days, the definition of an expert was a guy with two slide carousels from Boston. But everything changed when we got one of those, when we got one of those projectors, and when you didn't need the slides anymore. And that way, guys like me, we could work on our slides up to the last minute when we had to get up there. But what I learned was this. In the late 90s, you could put things up on the Internet. And I was leading these big international trials of new devices and drugs, and the first day I put up the slide set so everyone could download it, 10,000 people downloaded it. Now, for medicine, that's a lot of people. Uh, and it changed the way we communicated with each other. And things were great. I mean, we were all sharing the slides. I created a, a slide sharing service. Everyone would send me their slides. Everyone would download them and share them. And life was good. But that all changed one day. It all changed one day when I got a call from a major publisher who said, look, I'm calling you out of courtesy before I sue you. Um, but you just can't take tables and turn them into graphs, bar graphs, and put them on a slide. I mean, this famous journal owns the data, and we own the mode of display of data. And the data has to be displayed just as it was in our journal. A few days later, I got a call from a major medical society. They were upset about the slides I'd made up for my own study. 
said they had to come down. They sent me a letter, you know, threatening to sue me for copyright. So at that point, I knew I was onto something. I knew I was doing something good because so many people were so mad at me because <laughs> I was violating and breaking some business model of theirs. And then the final straw was when one of my research fellows came in and said, look, I'm a poor guy from Turkey. I don't have $450 to buy the articles that I wrote with you. We wrote those articles. We created that content. But he was being forced to pay $450 to get the content. So it got me thinking. It got me thinking about that monk again. It got me thinking about copyright and how this all evolved. Was anybody looking out for the monk? No. No one was looking out for the monk. The monk was sitting there making one copy of the information. Someone had already bought that copy, some rich person probably, and they were going to enjoy it for their own private use. Things got interesting when you had the printing press. Then, then you could rapidly distribute large volumes of content. And here's what happened. People started saying bad things about the king. Ooh, don't want to do that. And the king decided he need to have, you need to have the right to copy the work. And this really, this first law was really a censorship law. He created a private company. He couldn't read all the books. So he created a private company, the London Company of Stationers. They had the right to print books. They had the right to confiscate your books. They had the right to break your printing press. They had the right to do anything they wanted with respect to publications. And they had a register. And they put everyone's name in that register. You know, what's funny is the guy's name in the register it wasn't the guy who created the work. It was the guy who owned the printing press. So really, it was the distributor of the content that was registered, not the creator of content. And this law really protected the king, and it protected the guys who had the printing presses. Well, in 1709, Parliament decided, well, you know, this is a little heavy, the censorship. Let's lighten up a little bit. And they very cleverly said, you know, if you allow that guy right there to create the content, and if he's the owner of the content, I'm not censoring him. And then the guys who ran the printing presses, they said, well, this guy, he has no way to print this. He's going to have to come to me. I'm going to have to print it. And he's going to have to assign his ownership to me. So he won't own it anymore. I'll own it. I'll distribute it. And that's where we are today. Uh, you have uh, the people who create the content assigning over their ownership of the content to the distributor of content. And that's medical textbooks, many textbooks. They're paper. Those of you who write textbooks like me know that there's always this one guy, and he takes one year to get his stuff in. He's always the last guy, so your stuff is one year out of date by the time the last guy gets his content to you. It really represents the view of just a few people. There's no peer review of a textbook. Uh, it's text based There's no audio. There's no video. And again, it's copyrighted. And that means there's access to people who can afford it. Now, I think most of you take for granted that you can afford a textbook. That may be true in the United States. But look at these salaries for physicians in other parts of the world. A guy in Tajikistan, he's making $35 to $50 a month. He's not going to be able to buy a textbook that costs a few hundred dollars. He's not going to be able to get on the internet and pay $500 to $600 a year, a year to access the information. Uh, his hospital isn't going to pay $50,000 to $250,000 a year for him to access that. So he really can't afford access to medical information. So I think the early copyright laws made good sense when you had an expensive cost of distributing information. But now we have the internet. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't cost anything really to distribute information. It's practically free. And the big question is this. If you have information that is life-saving, should everyone have a right to that? Or should it only be there for people who have the money to access it as a privilege. And that's where I think the central debate lies. Whose rights are we protecting anyway? Are we protecting the consumer, the person who's sick? Are we protecting the creator of the content? 
or are we protecting the conveyor of the content? I think when we think about competition, we usually think of individuals competing. But what we've learned is collaboration is a very powerful force in evolution. In the old world, we had very expensive weapons of mass destruction. But now, through the internet, we have very inexpensive weapons of mass collaboration. We started off with an internet 1.0 model, one-way direction of communication, I broadcast to you. But now in a 2.0 world, we have bi-directional flow of information. There's a conversation. There's peer review of everything. When I was a kid, there was a rock star, and we had one show broadcast to millions of people. But now everything's inverted. Now we have millions of pieces of content, millions of songs broadcast to you as an individual. In the old world, it was vertically oriented. There was a silo. Everyone struggled and fought to get to that corner office. It was a command and control environment. But now you hear words like um, collective genius, uh, peering, online collectivism. In our office, there are no walls. Everyone sits in one big room uh, so that there is no silo. In medicine, you competed to be the brightest kid in the class and to be the best individual in a, in a sport. And your promotion depended upon your ability to publish. It was publish or perish. But now I think really we're looking for the kids that play well with others. The position has to be a team player. And now I think your promotion does depend on much broader ways of, of collaboration. For instance, I run trials that are done in 800 centers in 43 countries. I have to be a very good collaborator. The person who's the best collaborator is going to be the one that wins. So it's collaborate or perish. And what constitutes truth? In the old world, it was the professor. If the professor said it, that was truth. That's eminent-based. But now it's evidence. The data is what constitutes truth. And finally, in the old world model of medicine, it was paternalistic. I'm the doctor. I'm going to have a one-way conversation with you. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what to do. That's no longer the case. I mean, people go on the internet now and they show up to your office and they say, look, I know what's wrong, I know what I got, I'm just coming to you for a second opinion. Uh, so really it is now more of a conversation with a well-informed patient. And most importantly, information flow used to be very secretive, insular, insulated. Companies innovated from within their company. They didn't look outside themselves. Everything's changed now. Biotech is where Big Pharma looks to get their innovation now. And knowledge flows within the organization to everybody. And instead of having a copyright model, we've now moved over to what I call the copyleft model. So copyleft is a legal principle. Uh, it safeguards uh, the information being, from being controlled by any one person. Anyone's free to take that information, distribute it as they see fit, as long as they give credit back to you. A wiki is the software that's used to do this. All of you are probably pretty familiar with Wikipedia. You don't need to be a programmer to know how to use it. You can roll back the content to a previous date if someone makes a mistake. You can discuss the content and you can be notified if someone has made the content change. Wikis uh, may be less biased because there's a lot of people contributing to it, no one person can control the content. Uh, and it's very rapidly responsive to new information. That sounds good, but, uh, and wisdom of this crowd sounds good, but remember, everyone thought the earth was flat. And it wasn't until you had some content experts who looked up at the moon and said, look, there's a circle there casting the shadow that figured out it was round. So you have to have moderated wisdom of the crowd. You have to have experts who watch over things to make sure that the wisdom of the crowd doesn't give us the answer that the Earth is flat. How accurate is it? Well, there was an article in Nature that compared the Encyclopedia Britannica to Wikipedia. They had about the same number of mistakes. Uh, they were equally accurate. And I have to say, to come full circle with that little golden book, Encyclopedia, from 1968, it was in 2010. Uh, that the paper form of Encyclopedia Britannica went away. So what is the ideal textbook? I think it's free. Everybody should have equal access to life-saving information. 
No one should be paying for it. Drug companies shouldn't be sponsoring it. Device companies shouldn't be sponsoring it. It should be living. It should be updated continuously by experts. It should be copy left and widely distributed. It should be accessible on mobile devices. Doctors in other countries, they may not have even a computer, but what they usually have is a smartphone. And we're really working hard to get all that content onto mobile devices. Not only do you want doctor information, and our information is at the level of a specialist or subspecialist, you want patient information that is at the level of the fifth to eighth grade. And we have 1,200 pages of that now. We want information that is available to be reviewed for board exams that's free. You have to currently pay $500 to $1,500 to get that content as a medical student to review for your boards. We want that to be free. We want doctors to not have to sit in a classroom for an hour to get an hour of credit. Doctors learn by getting on the computer and looking things up. So we've created a way where you get micro CME or CME on the fly. By looking things up, you get credit for that. If you spend an hour or one minute and 13 seconds, you get one minute and 13 seconds credit. It should be living guidelines where people vote on the guidelines. They say whether they believe this new therapy is good or not. And of course, videos, sounds, slides, and uh, should all be added and multilingual. So nine years ago, I began this journey creating Wikidoc. We have about 7,000 people signed up onto the site. We have a dedicated staff, many of whom are here today, that work full time on the site on a volunteer basis. There's been 859,000 edits to the site, so we're coming up on our millionth edit. We have 31,000 free images up there, and we need you. If you're a student, we need you. We need people to do all types of things. We need people to help with grammar, uploading images, drawing pictures, helping with all kinds of things. So go to Wikidoc, click on contact us, email us, let us know. We'd love to get you on board. Today was about freedom, and I think for us, what we're trying to do is free, liberate that medical information from behind those paywalls so that we can have all have equal access to life-saving information. Thank you.